At first glance, Marklin Kennedy's life might sound like the start of a reality TV show. A college football player in Texas goes on to become Hollywood doorman on the Sunset Strip before settling down as a nightclub mogul in Las Vegas, opening clubs like Jet and Tao Beach and throwing divorce parties for the ex-spouses of rock stars. But Marklin Kennedy says he knows people whose lives would make far better reality TV than his life, and they're right here in Las Vegas. In fact, some of his biggest stars are prostitutes. He came up with the idea for Showtime's reality show, Gigolos, about five male escorts and the women who love them, and he's currently pitching a new show called Trailer Park Housewives. Marklin Kennedy joins us in studio to talk about his creative process and what makes a really good reality TV star. Marklin Kennedy, welcome to KNPR. Well, I thank you here. very much. Thank you for having okay, me. Okay, so reality show creators, you yes. know, one of the many hats you wear, you come up with the ideas and turn them into shows. But to give listeners a, a better sense of what you do, talk about the creative process. What is Trailer Park Housewives about? Trailer Park Housewives is a real look into the, the, the snow globe of what I really look at is, is reality, not as much television, but just what reality is today. That when the recession hit several years ago here in Las Vegas and also across the entire country, that people were hit in all kinds of ways. A lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of people had to start new careers. And Trailer Park Housewives came about because a lot of stuff that I was seeing comparable on television was uh, just wasn't very real. And so driving around, I live over in Green Valley, and I would pass by a lot of different of these mobile home parks around town. And in looking at those, I thought, boy, there's a lot of people in there that probably have great stories. And my wife and I were sitting around one night talking, and she's actually the one that said, you know, you should do a show on Trailer Park Housewives. So I started researching and going through a lot of these mobile home parks and talking to the people and seeing and Every single person that I talk to, the first thing they would say is, we are not the stereotypical trailer yeah, I was, park I was going to ask you about that because it did, the, the title, Trailer Park Housewives, immediately sounds like a pejorative where the you know, trailer park denotes right. a certain kind of person. But you were encountering people who defied the stereotype. Completely. And what I really found is that these people are real people that happen to live in a trailer park. It has nothing to do with uh, any kind of of humor that we're trying to play against them and say these are rednecks and everything. Even though I'm from Dallas and love the redneck lifestyle, it's not about making fun of the people. And we had to really gain their trust a lot saying, you know, if you want to open up to us and tell us your story. And they were very heart-wrenching stories. And everybody is in Las Vegas for a reason, but everybody I came across was in one of these mobile home parks for a reason as well. So how long did it take to gain their trust from the moment you started these conversations? Several, several trips of going in and I would say months of research going in and going around to all of the trailer parks and talking to the managers because it's a very controlled community. Uh, Everybody's very protective of each other. And they, they, for the most part, they didn't want anything being said that was going to either draw attention to them in a negative way because everybody's just trying to to better themselves. Every, I found a, a family of four that was living in a 35-foot, one-bedroom trailer, and they're happy as, as can be, but they are trying to find a way out, just like everybody after the recession hit goes, I, where's my 401K? How am I going to get that job or those, those points back or anything else? Okay, so this interview process begins. How did you find them, and, and who is showing up for these, these casting calls? I mean, is it the kind of thing we just leave a card on somebody's in somebody's door saying we're doing a reality show if you're interested some of that some of that i would go door to door and would go through trailer parks we would put up flyers uh, when the the one sheet went out which was an informative thing of saying this is what we're looking to do we're going to have a casting process if you're interested please send in your tapes or email any stuff like that and there were times where i would go door to door through some of these trailer parks and put them either on their cars or their doors or you would ask the the management of the place if they could put them in their mailboxes so it was very tough it was a long dr- grueling process of trying to get in and figure out just exactly what the story is because a name is easy to come up with and say trailer park housewives so that would just be kind of the the foundation of it now figuring out the body of it and the, and the life and the heart and soul of what it is you really don't know until you get through with it so when you did this, as, as, as you went through, how could you tell what would make or whose story would make for a good reality show guest? What, what, what catches your eye? What catches your ear? I interviewed them, put everybody on to tape on camera. So we had a, a production crew there, and 
as they went along, I had standard questions that I would ask. And you kind of look, I have a background in uh, when I went to college in advertising and journalism and public relations. And so I would ask standard questions, seeing what the hook is, seeing where somebody's going to pop and if there's something really interesting, kind of like this process. And so uh, a lot of the questions would come around until you get to the one where you kind of go bingo. There's something really interesting about this person. And some of the questions were very funny. We asked every single person what the capital of Las Vegas is. Had quite a few interesting comments. Uh, the capital a lot of, of Las Vegas. Capital of Las Vegas. What, what did they tell you? A lot of Carson cities. Uh, had Mandalay Bay. That was good. People actually think that, that one of the casinos is the capital of Las Vegas. But it, it kind of threw them off instead of thinking so hard about what they're trying to focus on. And then they kind of got out of, out of their, their head. And uh, I really think the hardest thing for anybody to do is to just be yourself and, and act in anything else. But Tell us a little bit about maybe an interview that took you by surprise, just kind of turned your expectations on their head or, or just it, it turned things around for you where you said, you said aha, you know, Eureka, this is, this is great. Yeah, I think that if I was always told when I was a kid, my dad, who's a very, very uh, interesting guy, but a very powerful uh, personality and he would always tell me at a young age you never get into trouble by listening and so I would listen to people ask a question I would shut up and then just listen and as the people continued to talk each one had something different that came out that really blew you away and I would pick up on this one lady that came in and she was very Shelley Duvall from cheer she very much was just like that she was very contained and controlled and had the librarian thing going on and I just went there's something about you there's something you're not telling me what is it that's going on in your life she was like I just nothing and I said have you ever wanted to be a madam and she just froze, and she goes, why would you say that? And I go, I don't know. I don't know. Something's going on. There's something really good here. And she goes, all of my life, that has been one of the things that I've never told anybody is that I've wanted to be a mad of my whole life. And you just look, and it was, it was an amazing thing. So there's this person in their story in their lives because I don't find myself that particularly interesting. Other people fascinate me. We are talking with Marklin Kennedy. He's a former nightclub manager and currently produces reality shows. He created the reality show Gigolos and is now working on a new show called Trailer Park Housewives. So what will viewers get from watching this show? What, are, what kinds of insights are they going to, to get by seeing this series? I think that people are going to be able to look into the lives of these Trailer Park Housewives and, of course, see a little bit of themselves no matter demographically where people live. But I think that they'll be able to look into reality versus seeing people that only fly on jets, only stay at the nicest hotels, go on the best vacations. They're going to see people that every day in and day out are doing everything they can to exist and survive. Now, you also came up with the idea for the show Gigolos. It airs on Showtime and it follows the sexual exploits of five uh, male escorts. How did you come up with the idea for that? That is very fascinating. Uh, Gigolos is, is a, a, a wonderful uh, idea that came about, and, and I'm very proud of it. It's just it's very funny to me, and I love the guys, and everybody has their own personality, and I think Brace is a hoot, and, and uh, Nick with his rapping, and Steve and Jimmy and Ben, all those guys are just fantastic. I was sitting around. Years ago, I had done a film. A guy that had produced the film had contacted me through Facebook, this guy Shane, and he had been one of the guys that over the years had come after me to do reality shows on me. Now, working in the nightclub industry out here, there's I couldn't really myself be on a TV show because uh, you have to protect the anonymity of the gamblers, the celebrities, everybody in the casino. So when this buddy of mine had given me a holler, he goes, I want to do a show about you. And I said, well, there's really not, why don't we do this or do that? And one thing we got to talking about is I said, you know, everything I see on television is about girls in the reality world. It's either going to be the bunny ranch, the strippers, the prostitutes, the hookers, the dancers, the, all the different things, meaning like in that genre. I said, what you don't really see is a story about guys. You don't have any shows out here really or on the air that are showing this reality that there's guys as much as there are girls doing this, this business, there's guys out there. And so over it took about two, maybe a year and a half to get it going. And so that is where it started getting flushed out. How did you get these escorts to commit to showing their business on TV? I mean, it's not only sort of private business, but it outside of uh, Clark County, prostitution is legal. In Clark County, prostitution itself is illegal. 
How did you how did you get around that? I don't really think that we're getting into that. A lot of that, again, is proprietary and going into what the actual escapades on the show are. Uh, I think that people being gigolos or being anybody for that, for that matter, uh, we all have certain boundaries that you release after certain times. And just like getting in here, people, it becomes very cathartic and therapeutic where you ask a question and you might be a total stranger, but people will want to answer because they don't know. And I think it's something on television, on any shows out there, people are showing a lot of themselves that they don't normally do. Yeah. I, when Jigglos began, some critics accused the show of being falsified, trumped up scenes, paid actors, things like that. Writer Richard Abowitz uh, was critical of it in The Daily Beast. I, are the exploits on the show real? Again, a lot of that is something that comes through with the proprietary stuff going on with it. Mm. Now, the show is a reality show. There is realness to it. Shows get into uh, where people are asking a lot of questions. I look at it that it's good that people are talking. Mm. So how do you convince the critics this is a reality show? I mean, reality is the, the bedrock. I think this in all shows, it's for entertainment purposes that people will watch television. If you're going to watch educational, because there's a million different types of shows that are on out there. Uh, this particular show, there's not a, a big, you have to uh, convince the, the watchers, the, the critics, everybody there. It's, it's a wonderful show that, that people are just addicted to. It took over as kind of a, a wonderful cult hit, and it's, it's a, a, gr- a really cool thing to watch. When I sit at home and watch it with my wife, and we're watching at the end, and there's my name, and all these things come up, it's not impactful enough to me versus whenever you're seeing it if I go to Los Angeles or if we watched on a big movie screen and there's millions of people. Like, so I don't really grasp how many people are actually watching it. But when you go out and people go, oh, my God, I love that show or the way that the guys are kind of bombarded because they all live out here and moving around. So it's, it's very fascinating. Now, it, about 13 years or so ago, 90, 1999, you were in a movie with uh, Richard Grieco uh, called Heaven or Vegas. Yeah, uh, Yasmin Bleeth, I think, is yes, in it as, as well. Vegas. And you, you played... You played a male gigolo. I did. So I played a gigolo. Is there just is this marvelous foreshadowing? I mean, is this a, <laughs> an illustration of that? that did was did the, it inspire you at all? That was <laughs> it inspire me. That was a lot of where the thought came from. And my buddy Shane was one of the producers on the show and on that movie. And this is how it came about. I said, you know, we should do that something in there because there's not been any other real films in the genre aside from American Gigolo when that came out with gear. And so it's, there's obviously a market for it. There's obviously something out there that can continue on. I'm sure hopefully there'll be other movies. There might even be a Gigolos movie. Who knows? <laughs> I'm dying to know a little bit about your background. You grew up in Texas and played college football there, which is um, unlike college football in any other state in the country, really. But you, you kind of went through all of that. You made it to Hollywood, became a doorman in Hollywood. How did you end up producing reality TV? What path led you there? I think everything we do is kind of makes us who we are. We're all products of our environment, our experiences. And my entire life growing up has, has always been uh, very mobile. We'll, we'll move around. My family was in the car business. My father was an actor. Uh, he traveled back and forth to L.A. He's been in ton of uh, Oliver Stone films and a lot of things. So I grew up in in this kind of entertainment industry. I was born in Houston, raised in Dallas. Uh, I had always grown up playing football in Texas because we always looked at it as the United States of Texas. <laughs> I'd made all Southwest Conference and was looking, had been meeting with the Cowboys and the Raiders and was going to continue on playing football. I was also playing rugby. And a month after I graduated, had this motorcycle wreck and Broke kind of everything on the left side of my body, and my foot came up and had a cerebral hematoma and shattered all these teeth down in here and one-inch separation in my shoulder and just awful things that had happened. And what happened was doors closed, but other doors opened. I had known Hollywood. I'd known L.A. from growing up and uh, with going out there with my, my parents and everything when my dad was doing movies. And... I made the move and wanted to go out there. I didn't necessarily go out to L.A. to get into acting. I just I wanted to explore the world. I wanted to see everything that was out there because I'd lived in Texas and Oklahoma my whole life and seen these things and seen people that had never moved. They had always been, stayed in the same spot, and they knew the same neighbors for 50 years, and they lived in the same house their grandparents were born in and everything. You wanted to see the world. I wanted to see the world. I wanted to get out and explore and experience everything that possible does because – 
uh, carpe diem may be a very uh, cliche thing to say, but to really make sure that you never, because you don't know the next day, you don't know what's going to happen. So I wanted to go see everything and got involved in films, got involved in television, did a bunch of different shows and ended up going over to um, Chateau Bar Marmont and Andre, who's the owner over there, they needed a door guy to come work there. And I'd been to bars at it never worked in any of the things, and so ended up working there. That, in turn, led into he had a place out on Shelter Island in the Hamptons, and then I went out and, and worked for him at this place called Sunset Beach, and that is really the beginning. So, of- yeah, all of these different experiences, how did they inform your current line of work? What, kind of, what, what would you say they, they gave you that would lead you into reality television? What impact would you do now? I think the easiest thing to say is that, and it's, it's this, these experiences that I had in the night life that I did brought it, but it's also my entire childhood. It's just, I never had fear. And whenever body or anybody would ever say you can't do that, I would always just say, well, why not? Why can't I? And there was a, a quote that I'd said about the only thing that made me think I could do it was because I never thought that I couldn't. And so it just kind of made logical sense when I said, hey, I have an idea for a show and see where it goes, and then it happens, I go, well, let's keep doing it and see what else we can do there. We're talking with Marklin Kennedy. He is a former nightclub manager, football player in Texas, and he's currently a producer of reality shows. He created the reality show Gigolos, and he is now working on a new one based in Las Vegas, Trailer Park Housewives. The reality show you created that you're best known for is about male uh, escorts, and you've uh, uh, performed marriages for people in nightclubs? I have. Yeah. I have. I, you've you've definitely in some of these things you've met some opposition. Uh, you were you were once picketed by a group of uh, yeah, some, Mormons. Some people came out and picketed me. I had gone through and I'd gotten ordained as a minister, and Fox News came out and followed me. And for some reason, people were picketing. I can understand because I didn't do it on a religious standpoint. It was purely for marketing, because I was seeing people come into the clubs, bachelor parties, bachelorettes, and then they would leave. They would go get married, then they would come back. I thought, why not just kick out the middleman? And I can marry the people right here. They never have to leave. They stay on property, and. And, and, and it started off as just me going online and getting ordained as a minister, and then I realized it took a lot more than that. I had to go through the county clerk. I had to get the uh, secretary of state seals and all these things to actually – because in Nevada, you have to have a lot of uh, other kind of certification to actually be ordained as a minister. And, to go and, and marry people legally, it's the solemnization of marriages. So minister is very kind of loosely is what they, when they call it that. So it has nothing to do with trying to abolish sins or anything else. But people thought that. People thought that I was kind of mocking or putting any kind of slight to the fact that this is a very uh, sanctity-driven entity that people are getting married and things like this to. And National news gets all a hold of it and everything. And I was, I even asked my mother before I did it, it's like, is this going to be okay? Am I going to get in trouble for this? She said, as long as you're not doing it where it's, you know, any, anything that you're intentionally trying to mock people, then you should be okay. Hmm. I, does that, that notion of mocking people, does that kind of denote a line that you, you don't want to cross and the, the things you create? I'm really for the, the, the underdog. I, I think that what, people look out of in their their soul and what other people look into are very different things. Uh, I, again, as we said earlier, I don't think that I am that particularly interesting. Everybody else does. And that's great. If 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 that's what the, makes everybody go around in the world and stuff, so it's fantastic. I, I want to find the people that are real, that, that uh, uh, are not hiding. You know, you have to be a spirit. You can't be a ghost in what you do in life. I, but at the end of the day, when, when uh, you, you know, you, you, you kind of root for the underdog in a lot of the things that you do. But at the end of the day, do you, do you kind of look, at, look around and think, okay, this is, after all, this is a business. And, and you know, the underdog thing is, is really great, and that's, that's what I'm about, and I'm glad to be about that. But it is a business. Do you ever, I mean, you ever sort of look in the mirror and, and think that to yourself as you're, you're contemplating what you're going to do next? It is a business. I think if you could relate that upon what charities are when people – really put their heart on their sleeve for whatever charity that they're looking at, you know, in the end, that is a business. It is what your your heart is doing for it and what the means are behind it of what those motives are. But if your intentions are good and you're not intentionally setting out to try to hurt somebody, then I think that it's okay. We've got gigolos and uh, working on uh, uh, Trailer Park Housewives. We've got reality shows about pawn shops. Bachelorette parties. I, the, the county coroner is is working on a new reality show. What is it about Las Vegas that makes this city so ripe for reality TV? 
it goes back to that anomaly about why Las Vegas is what Las Vegas is. And I think it's so transitory. Not very many people that I come across have the type of history roots that I spoke of talking when I grew up in Texas, that they've been here, their grandparents have been here, great-grandparents. Everybody's from somewhere else, for the most part, coming into the, the hospitality industry, everything out here. So everybody that comes in, they have a story of why they got here and how they got out here. I've got mine the way I got here. You got yours as well. And I think about Las Vegas is it is one of the top tourist destinations in the entire world, people coming here. So in doing so, we have a lot of lifestyles that go on here that are very fascinating. And there are probably a million different shows that you could do out of Vegas on any given day from the people that are living here. Everybody is fascinating when you come around them. Every cab driver, how they get here. Why are you driving a cab? What were you doing before this? What are you going to do after this? Everybody's got something. And it gets a little addictive when you're looking for stories and you're looking for interesting people because you, everybody's got a, the most fascinating story. And if you can get them to talk about it, it's, it's incredible. Do you ever worry that the stories that, that you hear about in, in these shows may ultimately be somehow hurting the image of this city? Vegas is a very show place. And it's... Is I think that as long as the hospitality industry can remember that it is about the customer and that it is about that guest coming in, then I don't think it will hurt the town as long as everybody embraces each other. You look at some of the shows that have brought a lot of jobs into Las Vegas. They brought a lot of recognition. They brought a lot of money into Vegas. You'll have some of the shows that are on currently where – there might be 2,000 people a day going to see that place. You look at when NASCAR comes into town to measure that success rate, when you look at the reciprocal dollars that are spent out, when EDC was out, those same type things. There's room rates that are being taken advantage of. There's buffets. There's restaurants. There's nightclubs. So the ancillary dollars that are being spent just because these certain things are out here. If it comes in and it's a very negative light, then, yes, it can be depending on what that show would be. Uh, but I think that it it, uh, it it nurtures itself out really quickly. We're visiting with Marklin Kennedy. He is currently producing reality shows. He created the reality show for Showtime called Gigolos. He's now working on a new one called Trailer Park Housewives. How would you describe yourself as a producer? I, I, are you willing to put out a show on anything, or do you have certain levels of, of quality control and, and uh, subject matter where – you're, some places you're interested, some things you're not so interested. I, I look at shows and potential people because I get pitched a lot now, especially where everybody thinks they're a show. Normally it's the people that don't think they're a show that are really interesting to me. I'm looking at a buddy of mine at Goodfellow Bail Bonds. It's an incredible story. He's got nine brothers, sisters. There's, they own 15 stores between them. He's a longboard surfer. He's a singer, songwriter. He has open mic night. He does a radio show. He's got kids. He's got a wife. He puts his kids in commercials. He does these funny forget about it things all the time. And you look at that guy, you're like, you're very interesting. He's a very interesting guy. Love that a lot. So other people that just happen to maybe be a, uh, a longboard surfer that likes to go up into the mountains or something, it's, it's interesting because you've got to really figure out what that through line is and what that show, that story is. Yeah, I was going to say, speaking of stories, yeah. your, your dad told you stories about old Las Vegas, yeah. the, the, the rack pack and such, and he spent a lot of time here as well. So what's uh, based on the things that you've heard him tell you, what is, what is the city like now compared to what it was a, a couple of generations ago? He was born and raised in Oklahoma. He went out to Hollywood, graduated high school in 57, and ended up getting into Hollywood. I think his his first television show that he did was with a guy named Ward Bond. And then he got into my father doing Have Gun, Will Travel, and Wagon Train, and Bonanza. And he ended up coming to Las Vegas and got involved with – he opened the Stardust Hotel. He worked for Max Factor. His name was on the marquee when they opened. And in those times, he met with and, and became friends with the guys in the Rat Pack. And he was actually a shill in the audience. So whenever the guys would get up and they needed to take a break, my father was the guy that he would heckle them, say, you know, get off. And actually, Dean Martin was, would go. His, his cue was, well, you think you're so good, why don't you come up here and sing? And so my dad had a golden throat, and he would get up, and he would sing a couple of songs while they would go back and change clothes. So he, uh, he's got a lot of stories out there that press has covered on where he 
uh, had to uh, escort Kim Novak around. He was at uh, Frank and Mia's wedding. He, uh, his stories are so much so that everybody wore tuxedos. The streets were all gravel, and everybody knew your name. So imagine a cheers-type mentality where you didn't have a player's card. You just came in, and the pit boss knew you and everybody else, and Mo and all the guys would just kind of go, hey, kid, and they'd have you come in. If you needed a marker, you needed something else, you could sign your name for stuff. It was a very small, small town at that point. Well, as somebody who's done some acting and entertaining yourself, I mean, do, do you look back at the things that you have done over your adult life and think, you know, it different world, but I followed in my father's footsteps? And I didn't realize that, and I never planned that because as a son, you always want to say, I'm never going to be like your parents, and by God, you always end up being <laughs> like them <laughs> because I never intended to go out to L.A. to be an actor, and I did. And I never had any plans in my mind where I woke up one day and said, you know what, I'm going to Las Vegas. And it wasn't until I was doing an interview one time and I was over at the Venetian, and the person said, well, you do realize this used to be the Sands. And I go, uh-huh. And they go, you know, this is where the Rat Pack used to be. And I go, uh-huh. They said, you do know that you have basically followed in your father's footsteps right here. And I go, uh-uh. Oh, <laughs> come on. That's not fair. Shut down. You snuck that in on me. I wasn't <laughs> expecting that. I just like, well, what does that mean? What does that mean that I followed in father's footsteps? Hmm. Now, about shifting gears a little bit, about 10 years ago, you were very involved in the nightclub scene as it was beginning to grow. You were part of the Light Group, helped to open Light, Jet, Tow Beach Nightclub. What was it like as a business in early 2000? And I've heard that you helped to kind of introduce the concept of bottle service to these to these clubs. Is that accurate? I, it, other people, A lot of people would say that. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I look at it, and it was just a fascinating time because it hadn't been done out here like that. That uh, they had had some sort of of you could go in and buy drinks, and then this was pre two thousand, and I think everywhere in the country that it got to a point where hey, I want to buy five drinks, why don't I just buy a bottle? But they didn't know they would just set a bottle down sometimes, and they would charge like fifty dollars for it, whatever it was, wherever. So whenever the two thousand came around and the, the nightclub was opening up. It had not been done like that in this town. You did have rain, which, which had just opened a couple of months prior. Babies had been around a little bit. Of course, the drink, of course, the voodoo, a lot of these things that have been here for a long time that were you know, just uh, standpoints for, for the town. And when it came through, we just had to realize that a marketing structure and a strategy and how you go after people and develop them into bottle customers. And then I had an enormous passion for it because it was so much fun mm-hmm. of enabling uh, an experience for somebody coming in where it wasn't about that dollar. It was about the fact that you got to affect these people, that they're going to go back and tell people what they experienced while we were out here, that if it was done right, they're not only going to tell their friends, that they will tell their friends and their friends and end up telling their children and their grandchildren that what they got to experience for one night out here, they will remember their entire life. But for us, it was our job. We did this every single night. Well, today, uh, there, there are billboards and full-page ads everywhere of, of Starlet's birthdays coming up. You can go to the clubs and celebrate those, pay $15 for drink, $500 for bottle service. How is it different? I mean, is it is it just that the, you're adding zeros to the price of a lot of things? And if, if that's the case, is the model sustainable with that, with that once-in-a-lifetime experience that you're talking about? Can people afford it? I think so, and I think the model is sustainable. I think that it is, again, continually reinventing yourself and staying relevant in the industry. And you have to give the people what they want, but you have to give them such a sensory overload that when they come in, they're not going to find anywhere else in the world what they can find here in Las Vegas. And it is each weekend you have to repeat and do exactly what it is that is going to affect that person going on. Now, again, you're only good as your last P&L. And that's everything. If you had a great weekend and you had the biggest celebrity in the world come in, that is fantastic for that weekend. Now you got to do it all over again for the next one. So that's why it's one of the the hardest industries in the world, which I've been some of the hardest things out there, which is crazy to me that I've been acting, lived in New York, lived in in Los Angeles, uh, lived in Las Vegas. And you look at it, it's like, why, why, why am I doing that? But it's, it's so interesting, again, on Las Vegas, the litmus of it, of why these nightclubs work, why the, the hospitality does work. And I think, yes, there's, there's natural selection that goes on. Some make it, some don't, but it will continue forward. So how did you take 
the expertise and the experience that you you pull together working with uh, with nightclubs and such and transpose into the world of reality television how, how where where do they overlap where do they they cross it doesn't there's really? there's there's no <laughs> fine line great answer i can put out and go you know uh confucius said i it just it came around i had done everything i did out here and had a wonderful time doing it and was whatever uh, affecting wise on on the industry here that uh, hopefully I was able to mentor a lot of people and and uh, and help people with their careers and, and their choices in it. I think that the greatest thing about what Las Vegas is is that it's about opportunities. And when people come out here, whatever age, right out of college, right out of grad school, whatever they're doing, that if you look around, everything about this town is about an opportunity. If you're working at a nightclub and you're there, longevity is maybe two years, maybe five, you get in there. If you haven't either a saved your money invested wisely done something out there that is going to help you whenever this this time that you're spending here and it's time to move on uh, by your choice or not then you have to look at it and go everybody that i meet on any given day in this town if i listen to them there's an opportunity there whatever it is reality tv came about because there was an idea and i had an idea and i implemented it and put it into motion if I had not done that, then I would have missed out and, for one, making history because it was the first television show in, uh, in history to go to where it went and to show and to push that envelope of where it is. So in looking at that, I didn't intend that. That was not the, the thing setting out to go, I want to make history. It's just that it did it, and I have a lot of other concepts and spaces and ideas and a lot of other things that I want to do in my life. And so – yeah, you've well, you've said in in our conversation that Las Vegas is about remaking, reinventing yourself, keeping yes. things fresh. So I guess so now that you mention that, I should ask what's what's the next uh, the next incarnation of uh, Marklin Kennedy going to be like? The Marklin Kennedy. Uh, I've got um, seven other shows right now that are under contract that uh, are moving that are that are pretty far along in stages. The, uh, the the concepts of them, some are, are – most of them are all Vegas, all Vegas because of the people that I meet out here. They're just fantastic. And if they want to do them, that's great. If people uh, want to look at it that I'm creating jobs, that you're bringing revenue into the city, then that's fantastic. If it can change these people's lives for the better, then, then for the, the people that are going to be on these shows, then that's fantastic. If you – if if one of the housewives can write a book and come up with a cooking line, can do these things and end up providing for a family and have a future for herself, that is fantastic. That's what it's all about. Me in the same way, I'm looking for my future as well. I have a lot of spaces that are moving right now. These things going, uh, where the future goes, it's going to be fun to see. Mark Luke Kennedy uh, spent some time as a nightclub manager, spent some time playing football. He currently produces reality shows, and he's got, as you just heard, several in development. He's created the reality show Gigolos on Showtime, and he's now working on Trailer Park Housewives. Mark Luke Kennedy, it's been great having you here. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you. It's been a blast. Thanks very much for joining us. Our producers are Irene Noguchi and Lee Hernandez. Our technical director is Rich Copeland. Ian Milchrist, a senior producer of the program. And the news director of Nevada Public Radio is Adam Burke. You can always continue the conversation from today's program by going to knprtalk.org. I'm Dave Becker. Thanks for joining us today for KNPR's State of Nevada.